think in the morning show this morning. So she's been up since like what? On Where tour. On yes, the tour. We're on yeah. the tour. Oh, I love Your that. voice is on the on the live. <laughs> we're live. So we are. We are oh. live. And um oh thank you. I know. <laughs> like three two, just, one. Just started. I know, right? <laughs> We have the Melina Michelle Edenfeld Foundation, and we have Michelle yeah. Edenfeld on the Do You Live Marketing Show. Um, off camera is Colin Chupa from K Squared Marketing, <laughs> a good friend of the show, good friend of uh, ours personally. Um, thank you for connecting us, and Michelle, thank you so much for coming in this morning. Really appreciate it. You're you're making your rounds. <laughs> I was oddly up um, because I'm I'm becoming I'm becoming. I feel like a very old man. I was up at five o'clock this morning for no reason at all. I mean, I took the puppy out, but um, uh, and then I saw you on WFMJ. Oh, yes. <laughs> you guys did great. You and your husband, yeah, Keith. It's okay. So, but yeah, yeah right. <laughs> so let's talk. Let's talk about your foundation. Let's talk about that and and start telling that story while while sure. people start jumping on, and then we'll jump into some other things too because you, not your day job. Your calling is. <laughs> Is uh, your mental health counselor? Yes, I right? am. So yeah. that's uh, that's a very interesting topic. I think that we want to get into as well. Sure. But tell us a story of uh, of Melina. Um, we want to hear about the the two puppy Westies that you got. <laughs> but uh, I want to hear the story and want to hear about the foundation and in, in the upcoming event as well. Okay. Um, well, you can kind of direct me because I could talk about my Melina for uh, the tour could go on a long time. Um, but we have three beautiful baby girls, um, and Clara, Emilia, and Melina, and we lost our youngest in June of 2020 to a pediatric brain tumor. God, trying to hear that. Thank you. Um, yeah, it. you know, her story of being sick was not long. Um, from the day we went to the ER to the day she passed away, it was only 32 days. Wow. Um, I think what's hardest for us um, is that she was never sick. Um, there was, you know, no sick visits. She had never even been on an antibiotic. Honestly, like, I'm sure she had a cold at some point in her life, but mm -hmm. I can't even remember that. Um, and she, this was also occurring in the midst of COVID. So the world shut down in March, yeah. and Melina um, got sick in May. Wow. Was when we found it. Um, we... Throughout time, learned about her tumor. It probably wasn't there any more than three weeks before we caught it. Had we showed up at the ER one day sooner, they would have missed it on the CAT scan. Mm. Um, and it took them, because she was so asymptomatic, it took them 10 days to figure out how aggressive it was. Mm -hmm. um, because where these tumors are located, they're actually in your brain stem. Uh, which is our foundation of life, and so they cannot biopsy them. It's a very risky procedure, so they have to weigh out the pros and cons. But but as we were waiting for the biopsy to occur, um, we saw the growth um, because she continued to decline. They they do, um, and so from that point on, um, the last week of Melina's life, she was home with us in hospice. And um, she was actually at my parents' house. Um, that was a decision that we made uh, for her sisters and for her. It was a safe place for her. We could have her people that she loved present because, again, this is COVID. So we were not allowed to have anybody in the hospital. A lot of the procedures we did were one parent only. Um, so we needed our family. She did, too, more than anything. Um, so we were able to bring her home to my parents' house, which is actually right next door to ours. And um, we told Melina um, during that time that we wanted to help the doctors find answers for what she had. <coughs> and, and she's how old? Four. Four, okay. And Melina, um, we asked her if that's what she wanted. At that point, she could still squeeze, and she squeezed. And my husband, will, she squeezed his hand. He's the one that asked her, and he will tell you it was the hardest squeeze she did that week. Um, but I'm not surprised at all because that's just who Melina was always. Um, she was just an empathetic kid. Um, her neuro team came in the one day and they checked on her in the morning and they were in street clothes. Well, they had an emergency surgery and they came back to check her in the afternoon and they were in scrubs. 
And the neurosurgeon went to talk to her and Melina said, wait a minute, and put her little hand up and said, how was your surgery? And we were all floored. Like, how did she know there was a, but their clothes had changed. And the doctor looked at her and said, well, thank you, honey. We saved a little boy's life. And the, and the neurosurgeon turned and looked at me and said, how does a four-year-old have empathy? And I said that the whole process is the only question I could have answered um, because she was Melina. Yeah. It's amazing. Yes. Um, and your, your other children. Yes. How old are they? So uh, when Melina passed away, they were eight and six. They're 22 months on both ends. Um, so now they are, Emilia, our middle daughter, is eight, and then Claire will be 10 next month. Gotcha. So Michelle Edenfield of the Melina Michelle Edenfield Foundation. Um, um, so so this happened, and it, it's obviously, it, it's very fresh, right? I mean, yes. it, you know, and you, felt, you formed the foundation obviously pretty quickly. What is the foundation about? So the foundation actually started, she knew, um, so we started the process, like, really, um, like the attorney's involvements and all of that stuff to like do the paperwork and to do all of that. Um, so we've been around for about 18 months now. Um, we've raised $450,000. What? I, yeah, I know. That's I, wonderful. There's days where it's just like, oh my gosh. And it's, it's so amazing. Yet in the next mm. breath, it's like, it's like, how do you say we raised 450,000? And you're like, it's not enough. Yeah. You know? Um, so w w w through what types of activities? Well, so our goal with our foundation is, you know, my husband came to me, my husband and my dad are the co-founders. They, this was their idea. They're amazing. And this is what they said. And, and we knew we, we had to make something of this. How do you make this make sense? Yeah. You know, and the only thing that we could think of is we, we had to give it to help. And so they, they had talked about this and they came in the room and they said to me, Michelle, what would you have needed? And I said, I, I need answers. Like, I don't, I don't care how much help you would have given us. And, and that's amazing. But the reality is, I didn't, there was nothing. I had nothing. I couldn't do anything. Yeah. There was nowhere to take her, nothing to do. Um, and so we, all of our funding that we raise goes towards pediatric research for the pediatric brain tumors. So it is all research-based to find the clinical trials, the medications, the things that work for these kids. Um, our goal you know, pediatric brain tumors are the worst, most deadly cancer that exists. So our thought process is, you know, if you can cure the worst, you can cure them all. Like if we can find answers to this, how many other things are we going to help along the way? Sure. Um, so that's a little bit about that piece of it. Um, and then what was your next question? <laughs> and now I'm like, I get a little too gentle. It, it's just, it's, it's a remarkable story. And, and, you know, uh, we're, we're lucky. Um, you know, we're blessed. We've, we've got four kids, 12, 10, 8. It's coming up on birthday months. So we have four birthdays in the house uh, from March 13th to April oh, 17th. Birthday. <laughs> Crazy. And back to back days, too. Um, and our, our four year old Leo uh, was born with a congenital heart condition um, at, at birth. They found us about two days in. Uh, we we won that rare lucky lottery, right? That you know, your kid is one of you know twenty thousand or fifty thousand kids that are born with this, and we ended up in open heart surgery when he was six months old, um, right around actually around the same time. And so you know, having gone through, um, you know, and it's, it's not really fair to compare the two. Um, you know, I'm sensitive to that, but the. Uh, going through that with your child, it's just it's, there's a there's a lot that comes along with it. Sure, yeah. and you know you said something there, and it's they say it's rare, and and you're right, and I think this is what's so hard. Um, it's also what's so amazing about our community. The reality is is yes, if we look at a small, like geographical area, it's rare, but if you put everybody together, it's not as rare. Yeah, and so the hard part is like if. 300 kids, I always say with Lena, were hit at the same exact crosswalk every day. We do something. Right. But the problem is my 300 kids, it's more than that, but are all over the United States. So it's hard to put all that community together. Sure. And the reality is, is it comes from the parents who are fighting. And, you know, when you're fighting for pediatric cancer, that's getting 4% of national funding. That's it. And, you know, the rest goes to the adults, which is great. 
but we're forgetting these vulnerable right. people and it's like well they're kids so the only people that can fight for them are their families but yet right. you're in the middle of it right. and, and like you said like what comes along with that all the i mean you're in a storm and you're just watching everything spin around you and so i think like that's where you get that's where it's so hard is that you know, I always say, like, you know, it's the victims, yet we're the ones fighting for the solution. Right, right, and um, and and then the other thing that gravitated, uh, obviously, when when I heard the stories, I always want to like help everybody out the community that we could possibly <clears throat> help and create awareness for um, uh, what you are doing and in, in, in others in, in foundations and get your story out. I've got a very very good friend of mine in New York City that his kid has is um pediatric cancer and he's been going through treatment all through COVID as well um and and you're right there's just not a lot of resources that are out there um for pediatrics there's care but there's not a lot of information well and and so part of what we've done with our 450,000 is that Akron children obviously um we believe very much in supporting local mm -hmm. also I will tell you um, because of my job, I work with um, some doctors at other hospitals, other institutions, and I called her at 3.30 in the morning, and I said, am I in the right place? Like, I don't even know what to do. And so by 5.30, I had six emails from Cincinnati, both notes, stay right where you're at, these are the doctors. Yeah. Like, and, and to think, like, that's what Akron has, and they are amazing. And um, so our goal is to, you know, we have a pediatric uh, brain tumor research fund at Akron that we, that's where our $200,000 is. Um, but we also joined two different international collaboratives, but the one is called the Connect Consortium and there's eight of us. And what we're forcing hospitals to do, there's 13 institutions currently, I think it might be 16 now, we just had a meeting, but um, they're forcing them to work together They'll be shared information. So you'll have one clinical trial running at one hospital and one at another. We're like, we'll put your data together. Well, the challenging part is this. So I, I have a little bit of insight to this because of my uh, career path through healthcare IT. Mm -hmm. So various vendors over the years have um, developed repositories that basically hospitals and clinics can be basically data dump cases into. Mm -hmm. um, then, then you start to deal with like our artificial intelligence to develop treatment protocols. So at scale, at the macro level, you're able to you're able to like tumor protocols. Like there's a tumor board at every hospital. Sure. And they basically then take those cases, they would put those into, and then it's like here's the standard of care for this particular instance, or this particular instance, or this particular instance. And in capitalistic medicine, it's very it was very difficult to get the entities to play nice with each other mm -hmm. <clears throat> um and then the second thing is is that unfortunately there's not much um so so with better care but hospitals are are we're strapped for cash so they're like how does this impact us our bottom line unfortunately mm -hmm. and that's really what where but the technology does exist like sure there's various vendors that have it but you know, develop better treatment protocol, that sort of thing. Well, so of these institutions, now these are, there's one in Montreal, there's a couple in Australia. Australia is very ahead for brain tumor research for pediatrics, and we're forcing them to work together. The other part of that is, um, and I know a lot of what you're saying, because the uh, DIPG collaborative that they work with, which is with the Cure Starts Now in Cincinnati, um, Molina's type of tumor is the only tumor that has a registry. There's a DIP registry. So every tumor case whose parents release that information, yeah. it's the only registry that has all the data of every kid that has had this in one place. Right. And that's it's housed currently at Cincinnati. When when they um when the, we got Leo's surgery, we were actually went down at UPMC Children's and um, they asked us if they could take any remnants from the surgery. And it was like, they're like, explain it to us. They're almost microscopic, but like if they're able to take remnants from the surgery, they're able to then go and apply something as minutiae as that into research mm -hmm. um, to try to figure out why 
these things happen and better treatment protocols is really um, it's really uh, remarkable. The, the microscopic um, uh, cells like they're able to grab from that and go research it. Well, and, and it's very true. So with Molina's tumor, that's actually the issue they have is they can't get to them. So you can't how do you figure out a treatment for them you can't touch. So a lot of what they need is parents to donate the tumor after the child passes away. Yeah. Um, you know, I somehow started saying, you know, we were all in um, when we started our foundation. Apparently I thought I was LeBron James. I don't know. Like, I don't know, we're all in. Like, and then I'm like, I think I heard that before. Like, um, so, you know, apparently I'm going back now. But, um, and I said that and, and we did, we made a very difficult decision, but for us, it wasn't difficult Yeah, because we did donate her tumor because I, I felt like, well, first off, I said as a mother, like, I don't want that in her anymore. Like, yeah. um, if I couldn't get rid of it when she was alive, the heck I'm letting her take it with her. So, um, but it was, it, I think it's a very difficult choice for some parents to, yeah. to do that. Right, right, right. And, yeah. then, and then now we're at even more relax. So it's it's a it's a tough call, but it's amazing what they can do with the information. So sure. we know that Melina is part of that registry. And that's actually what Akron is doing currently is they're expanding their brain tumor research program now with our fund. It's phenomenal. And you have an event coming up. Yes. In March? March 19th. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's uh, an evening of joy. So this is, we have, um, last year we ran three events. Um, we did a golf outing. Um, we have the Choose Joy event in the summer, which is for kids on the green in Campfield. It's families and kids. Um, this year it's on <laughs> July 30th. Um, but it's a free event and it was fun. And it, that's just Melina's heart. Her friends run it. It's an amazing thing. Um, we raised over $20,000 there last year. Wow. Um, yeah. And then we have a virtual 5K, um, which we had over 625 runners. This no year. way. Yeah. Runners, walkers, skippers, dancers. I don't care. Put on her shirt, go out and do it and have fun and find this her joy and we all win. Yeah. Um, will you keep that event virtual? We will. So it is something that we debated. Um, you know, unfortunately we started in the midst of COVID. So like it kind of started virtual. It was our second year this year. But we have had so many people remotely yeah. um, that, and it became so fun because everybody's kind of taken their own spin on it, which yeah. is amazing. Like they've created teams and then they have certain dress and then they post the pictures. And it was almost like we can involve more people, not forcing it to be on one set day and one set yeah. time. So you have the whole month. So it was just, it was amazing. Like when I think back and they were these bright green shirts this year and like she's everywhere. Um, and so this event though on, Mar on March 19th, mm -hmm. where, where, where is it at? The embassy. Okay, embassy. And what's what's going on? So Melina left parties. Okay. And um, Melina went big for parties, for birthday parties. <laughs> and so her four-year-old birthday party, um, Melina came to me and said, Mommy, I want Fancy Nancy. And I'm like, we can do Fancy Nancy. And apparently by Fancy Nancy, she meant one flag of Fancy Nancy, and the rest was leopard print, yeah. which Melina called Cheeto print. And um, <laughs> it was god-awful. It was hideous. And, like, I would think, like, most kids would pink, like, pink Cheeto print, or no. It was, like, leopard print. It was a bad bachelorette. <laughs> and I can remember going and buying the balloons, and she picked out the brown spotted balloons, and then a bright pink four, which we were like, okay. And I'm by this, and the lady looks at me and goes, Are these for her birthday party? And I was like, Yes, they are. And she's like, Is it bad that I want to come? And I'm like, No, not at all. Like, I could have just handed out shot glasses and called it a day. It was right. it was bad. Um, but that was her. And and she just loved people to come and get together. So we created this event. It's called an evening of joy. And we said, How do we make this Melina? So it's an elegant, classy event with a streak of trash right down the middle. So. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and people could get tickets to go? Yes. Or is it sold out? Or We're, uh, We have about 75 tickets remaining, Okay. Um, that's, which is, I just never even dreamed. Um, and so it's, you could go, the easiest way to do it, I could give you the actual website for the tickets. That would require me to remember it. But uh, <laughs> if, if on our actual Foundation Facebook page or our actual website, which is mmefoundationjoy.org, um, that has 
the event. And if you click right on it, the link to get tickets. And it will actually um, put you into, once you buy your ticket, you can see all the silent auction prizes, all the live auction prizes, Ovation, the band, um, donated their time. And they're going to play for us. It's an open bar. The food's amazing. Um, and then we have to end the night with a little bit of Molina. So everybody has to leave with a favorite ice cream. This was like the yeah. process. So you're going to get your twist cone with rainbow sprinkles. Twist cone, rainbow sprinkles. On the way out the door. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, who couldn't imagine leaving with that? Um, I, well, <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's just amazing. And in, in, um, this is an amazing story. How do you... Um, how do you, you, you work in mental health? Yes. Um, adolescents, adults, kind of all, both. Um, my career path was a little bit different because I started in Pennsylvania. So when I was in PA, um, cause I went to school there and, um, I did a lot of children and families, but I moved back to Ohio <laughs> because of the changes in licensing. Um, I had to redo my supervision time and I did all adult care. So my caseload looks a little different than most, but mainly I have adolescents and adults. Yeah. Um, I would say probably 20% is adolescents to, to children. So, I, I mean, how, 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 how did your family, how do you and how did your family deal with um, the passing of Melina, how do you work with your, your kids? Did you personally work with them, or did you end up seeking outside help? What, talk, talk to me a little bit about that. And oh, so, so I will say that was a really, it's a really it was a tough call for for me with with our girls. Um, I wanted to stay very much on top of it. Um, my Emilia, my middle daughter, it, it, you know, every child is different, and they're going to handle it different. I don't know what will really rock Emilia's world in life. Um, she, she, she's them. And if you meet her, you would love her. Um, and she just goes through, I mean, we're not sure what color the sky is in Emmy's world. Um, she's just friends with whoever. She probably wouldn't learn your name because that's just way too much effort. Um, and her and Melina were besties, but Emmy just takes her with her. So like one day I was at the kitchen table, it was long ago and I had tears in my eyes and Emmy's like, are you okay, mommy? And I'm like, oh, I'm just having a Melina moment. And she goes, mommy, I don't know why. And I looked at her and she's like, she's always with us. And like, off she goes. And like, so Em just processes things very different. Um, that's not to say a year from now, she's not in a different place. No. I made a very big decision when they went back to school. The hospital said to me, you have to call the school and you be your first phone call. Um, C.H. Camels, where our kids are at. And they were amazing to me. But I said to the principal when I called, I said, listen, I need teachers that are going to call me. Because Emmy's not going to do bad on a test because her sister died. You know, Claire's not going to have a rough day because her sister died. Melina is not our excuse in life. She's our reason. And that's something that the girls and I talk about all the time is Melina's our reason that we're, she, she pushes us to be better people. She pushes us, you know, we, we strive to do better because of her and for her. Um, so that's a lot. Clara struggles a little bit differently. Also, I think she was older. So I think kids genuinely asked her more, you know, like I think they were trying to understand and everybody has been very, very kind. There's never been, we haven't dealt with a negative situation and, and kids are curious. Um, so Clara and I talk a lot about how to handle it, what we talk about, those types of things. Um, we have little um, books that we keep of our Melina. We call them Melina moments, Melina smiles, and we write them and those types of things. Um, I think the kids also, the foundation helps them tremendously. Yeah. They feel good when they see, they'll be like, mommy, somebody was wearing Melina's bracelet or somebody had on her shirt. And like, I think that makes them feel like she's not forgotten. Yeah. Um, so it was a, it was tough. You know, my husband and I also grieve very differently. We're very different people. And so I think that's hard because you're living the same thing and handling it totally different. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, I mean, 80% of marriages fall apart when this happens and I get it. Yeah. Cause it, well, families fall apart. Yes. Like tragedy, unfortunately brings yes. this, um, you know, and, 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 and you know, Every family's unfortunately had to go through something. My wife's family, she lost her sister at 18 years old when she was a freshman in college in a tragic plane accident, her and her brother-in-law. And, and all the families have stayed close together. Um, 
you know, luckily, luckily for me, the guys that she dated prior didn't really ever want to talk about it. They felt it was like kind of awkward where like I was like from day one, I was like, whatever you want to talk about. Um, and their family always has a similar approach. Um, you know, they're always present at every meal. Their names are brought up. My daughter, Paulina, is named after, you know, her sister, Paula. Um, and and so, um, you know, like it, it just I came to the story 10 years into it. So my grieving started i never met them mm -hmm. but i met them if that makes sense yeah and so i had to deal with things 10 years into the story and then different times of the year like you know just bring up different emotions i i would say yeah and i and i think you know it's it's that makes me feel good actually hearing that because that is what we you know malia's always ours and she always will be ours and you know, I still hang her stocking at Christmas because she's mine. So yep. coming in my house, she belongs to me. And I get to be her mother till the day I die. Um, but I think, you know, it's also like hearing that new people come in. And, and there's a lot that we do to honor Melina as our family, um, my whole family, you know. And, my God, there's more rainbows and cheetah print everywhere in our oh god it's bad like in our life like this child left me with leopard print and so <laughs> it's it's everywhere and you know in our house we have just a little bit in each room so you might not notice when you walk in but and my my neighbors were like a huge part of that because they they're the same way they have cheetah print in their house so when i walk in like i know they still talk about her yeah and it's just there's a piece in in knowing that yeah you know yeah, yeah, yeah. no and it's um and, and like you said, everybody grieves different. And, yes. and that's a, like my family on my side, they kind of go the dark humor route and, and find the jokes within to, to and my wife has always found that to be very uncomfortable. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my wife's always found that to be very uncomfortable, but I'm like, this is just how my family kind of gets through some of these tough moments is, is. Oh, I think humor saves us. Yeah. You know, I can remember, and I mean, I'll share this story, but I was falling apart and then we had to go through Melina's clothes. And the problem is they just kept popping up, like in the laundry. And, you know, it just, like, that's the stuff you don't think about, you yeah. know? And I just, I said to my mom and sister, like, I can't, I can't keep finding these things. And so they're like, you know what, we're, we're going to go through everything. So we set the day aside and my dad looked at me and I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, I don't like, I don't know. He's like, I'll tell you what, Shell. She comes back, we'll buy her all new things, all new things. So like the whole time we're like packing, you know, and going through these things and, and there's my, my mom sitting there and everybody's in tears and I kept going, we're just going to buy her all new things and all the, and, and, and it's so, you know, people would be like, really? And it's like, but that's how you get through it. Cause you, if not, you'd crumble. Yeah. You, you can't, you know, it's just, and I will say that the first thing I said to my husband, this is probably two weeks after she passed away. Um, you know, you struggle to sleep and you struggle and you have all those images you wish you didn't at that, you know, time, your brain just doesn't let go of those things. And, you know, um, I looked at him and I said, we can't break, you know, and he looked, looked at me and I said, we can't, because if she knows in any capacity where we are, I can't have her think that it destroyed her family yeah. because she would kill us and her sister's or her world. When she was in the hospital, I mean, we have a video, we have multiple of her talking to them, telling them where to be when she was coming home. Like, here's what you guys are going to do. And here's where you're going to find me. And they listened always her whole life. Like they always did whatever Melina did. We all just gave in because I think she was number three, you're tired. Yeah. Nobody was going to fight the fight. So like they'd be sitting next to each other for breakfast in the morning. Melina would come down and Emmy would just move over. Cause like Melina demanded the middle. Like that was just, yeah. So I just said for her, I just can't let her, I have to let her believe that we're stronger with her, that we still have her. Right. You know, and that's so, a tough call. So as you, as you put on both your mom hat and your mental health counselor hat, anybody dealing with, you know, um, loss, sudden loss, even, I mean, even, you know, somebody that dies of natural causes of 85 years old, is, yeah. but, but mental health, like, should they, do you, what do you think? about count like going to get help going to get counseling like what do you think about that well what's your, what's your advice i'm a huge positive believer in counseling um but yeah. no, in all honesty and I, I say this all the time we can't compare stories in life what's a tragedy to me may not be a tragedy to somebody else what somebody else has lived in their life you know i might look at it and be like really you know um 
and we can't compare stories. Everybody has their story. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, but I always say, I think anybody can benefit from mental health by struggling. If you're losing the quality of your life, um, everybody has the opportunity to feel better. And and none of us understand the idiosyncrasies about ourselves. We were all complex and we all have parts of ourselves that we don't like, or we can't manage. Um, and sometimes just being able to work through those things, um, makes us better and and who doesn't want to be their best self um but i think going and getting counseling is hard it's hard to come in and trust somebody and it's hard to find the right fit too so i think people are apprehensive often but i always say like you know it gets in and 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 we work to be better and to, to you know grief is i i think is one of the most challenging emotions in different ways because you it, it just it floods you in different like out of nowhere sometimes mm-hmm. and it's so out of your control that am I going to ever make that go away? No. Cause uh, I'll never lose, like make Melina and no, she's always going to be just as powerful. And some days driving home from work, it hits me harder, but I could just brace myself. Now I know I can sense it. Like I know today leaving here, I will crumble at some point today because these things are hard. I, in the moment I can do it. And for her, I'll do anything, right. but it doesn't mean that, you know, sometimes reliving her things are hard too, you know, and we're still only 18 months out and right. it's weird. People give you a year, except, except your close people. Those people I think understand. Right. Um, yeah. You know, it's it, when, when we, we made a video, so uh, I was a 25 year anniversary of the rich center for autism, which also unfortunately means that that center was founded by my wife's family after the tragedy happened. So there's also, 26 years that they passed away and um i was given an honor and an opportunity to to go make that 25 year anniversary video and so we went down to the crash site um and and you know like um and then you know interviewed my my family and like those are just like long days like mm-hmm. it has to be done yeah but those are really long days and emotion emotionally wipes you out it does. Well, and here's what, what people don't understand about Melina's tumor. So Melina's tumor was in her brain stem, meaning it affected her physical functioning. So Melina slowly declined. She lost her ability to walk, and then it became her ability, you know, to swallow. It, it, things like she, her vision was affected. Um, you know, she started seeing double at one point. So, and it affected her heart. Um but it never affected her cognitively. Yeah. And that as a parent is a very hard thing for me because I look back and think like my four-year-old knew she was dying. And there was a moment where my family, we had to make a decision. We we're supposed to go on vacation to the beach. Molly wasn't well enough. So, I mean, obviously that we planned a beach vacation a year before sure. this mm-hmm. even happened. So we decided to send the girls with my family, my mom and Keith and I, and Melina stayed back to start her radiation because we didn't know what it was going to look like. Right. And I didn't want to scare the girls. They were never afraid of their sister. And I, we just didn't know. So we figured, let's give all the attention to Melina, let the girls go have their joy. We're standing in the driveway at this point, I'm holding Melina. And Melina watches everybody, you know, leave. And she looks at me and says, Mommy, I'm not going to the beach. And I looked at her and I said, Oh, no, honey, you're not. And, you know, we know that, but we're going in August. Poppy already rented the house. Like, we're, everybody's taking off work. Everybody's going back. We're going to go when you feel better. And she looked at me and said, No, Mommy, I'm never going to the beach. And looking back now, I don't think I was ready to hear that. Like, to comprehend that she knew. Two days later, she starts radiation. I went in the room to get her after the it's 15 minutes and I go to pick her up and she looks at me and went Starbucks. And I thought in my head, are you kidding? Like you're in a rainbow tutu dress who shows up for radiation dress like this. And the child's first thing to me is Starbucks. So I can tell you that my Melina chose joy every day of her life. Yeah. And what I've learned from her and I, I use this even at work um, and I've always kind of known I can't control my circumstances in life. I can't stop bad things from happening. The only two, like the only choice I have is how I'm going to respond to it. Yeah. And if my four-year-old can choose joy, I mean, in my forties, I came and process death. And if she can choose joy, then so can I. Yeah. 
And that's why we do that. And that's why, you know, we say choose joy for Melina. And I know how cliche it sounds. I mean, I'm a mental health counselor now screaming choose joy, like chasing rainbows, dressed in leopard print. Like right. at the end of the day, that's more powerful than that. Yeah. If somebody, my thing is this, am I going to be the, the, are we finding the cure for pediatric brain tumors? God willing. I hope so. Realistically, I don't know if that's in my lifetime. I think it's there. I mm-hmm. just don't know when. Right. My grandmother is going to be 92 next month. People in her life died that penicillin now fixes. Right, right. So is it going to happen? Yeah. And and I hope we're part of that. But Melina's why and her purpose is so much greater that if you go home today and there is a moment where you just have that day and then you're like, you know what? I can choose joy because a four-year-old little girl told me to. Right. Then we all win. Ground you in perspective. Um, cause there's days like mm-hmm. that we, we, you know, the further that we get away from the event, sure, the, the, the easier it is for me to, to blow my top about something pretty small. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. And then, and then, you know, and then you're like, um, in comparison, like, all right, get, get a grip, like get a hold of yourself, mm-hmm. you know, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. A big things, little things is always what I say. Yeah. I don't know what more big things. So over over COVID, um, as a mental health health counselor, yeah, you got increasingly more busy. Yeah, yeah, um, and I would say, um, you know, people really started, you know, isolating people. I mean, people are here for each other. We right. all are. People need people. Like we, I mean, we always left. Like women can't go to the bathroom by themselves. Like you know, people function as groups. And so I think when that isolation occurred, um, or even when people started working more from home, you know, in the beginning, it sounds great. Right. But then all of a sudden, you're isolated. You're not, even if you say hi to somebody walking down the hallway, at least it's different. I worked, I worked from home, actually, in like 2005. I went from a very people-intensive business to then being in a corporate job, sitting in my office, and getting together with those other three team members like one time a year. So I would literally like talk in the computer all day long. And I found myself like going out to the grocery store just to have human interaction, like talking to anybody and anybody, yeah. anybody that would listen. Yeah. You know, and I think it was, and then I think too, I, you know, I feel bad a lot for adolescents, yeah. you know, middle school, you know, they're starting their social realm. They're just, well, all of a sudden everything's, what is it on? Your cell phone or online. Yeah. And like, like kids were like, well, I don't even know how to say like, hello because at lunch now you're three feet apart so now you went back and like you're sitting three feet from people well now that kid that struggled to fit in is now really <laughs> exiled because they're yeah farther away so it just created such a i think a hardship in that room too plus there was all this loss going on i mean i even look at our situation we're in the middle of COVID. if facebook didn't exist i don't know how many people would have known she was even sick right you know we you know we're grieving and i can't even hold calling hours right it was in a way was a blessing looking back now. I don't know if I could have done that, you know, but like, think about that. Like this is, I can't even imagine anything more tragic my family can live through um, other, with our other two children. But, it, you know, and we don't even get the support of people. People were like leaving things at our house, which is amazing. But yeah. think of that though, you know, there was just so much right. that, that people lost during that time. With just that human interaction, I think that's what really. And the, sti- the, the I think the good thing is that the obviously the stigma behind mental health is is seemingly, I don't want to say going away, but it feels like it. It obviously people recognize like, you know, you got a broken arm, you go to the doctor, and having a broken brain isn't necessarily broken. It's just you need to go get help. Sure. You need to go get something fixed. Yeah. And and we're starting to accept like you're not completely crazy. You just need need some help well yeah and and none of us can control chemical imbalances in our brain right you know we didn't and that's what tell people you didn't like wake up and you know go to giant eagle and, and grab a bag of anxiety <laughs> and be like yeah i'm gonna try this on today like you know oh nobody wakes God. up and goes wow i really hope my brain just races to the extreme right, you know? right 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 and then it's but you they, people did it was like well, i had to make it better or like and then people will tell me thoughts and they'll be like michelle this is nuts and i'm like yeah i think like that too now you know <laughs> Well, I am crazy, right. but we're good, <laughs> you know, and, but it, it was true. And I think when all that was going on, plus, you know, all that too, now you got a bunch of people sitting behind a computer screen, things got really volatile. 
because it's much easier to type things <coughs> than it is to say it to somebody's face. So now you've got kids that are, there's even more stuff going on. There's even harder comments being made and harsher things sure. happening all the way through to adults, you know, and, and I, I just think there was a lot of that where people were just so struggling alone, much alone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, like after Leo, so from the time, the day that he was diagnosed to the time that he had the open heart surgery, I just basically took everything and like, was like, and then, and then he was finally fine. Um, and then piling, piling some big work projects on top of that. I would say like three months after the surgeries, when it like really all hit me, like mm-hmm. it, it was just like, holy shit. Like, what did we just, you know, go through? And then that led into, um, a funky place mentally for me where I was never depressed. I was never like anxious, things like that. And it really started to affect me. And I don't think that like when I said, then, you know, you like, you go Google like, Oh, <laughs> I'm like, you know, yeah. like, I'm experiencing anxiety. I'm depressed. <laughs> like, you know, and, and, but you know, and people always say like, you could come talk to me, but really at the end of the day, like I felt, I feel like a lot of people are like, they say it and they don't mean it. Mm-hmm. But you don't always know where to go when you're experiencing that. Like, who who can I go talk to, right? Sure. Like, who can I – and um, it's just overcoming that obstacle because if you don't, though, you just go down even further. Well, and you're right. It gets worse because then you're stewing in, in, in these thoughts. And you're right. I had a, a woman come to me. This is years ago, but she sat down. I'll never forget it. And she looked at me and she said, Michelle, I had cancer. And I looked at her and I said, wait, wait a minute. And I said, because we were talking like, you know, why are you here? And what, can, you know, and, and she's like, I, I had cancer. And I said, wait, you had cancer or you have cancer? She's like, no, I had cancer. And she's like, I went through everything for three years. She's like, but I don't even think it hit me because you get by. You, you As a dad, you didn't let yourself feel those things because right. you, you had to get through. You know, people say to me all the time, like, how did you guys do this? Well, I didn't process that my child was dying. I, I did what I had to do every day for her. Right. And then that month after, I can remember my one friend calling me every morning and she was like, are you up? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, I don't have a choice. I have two other little girls. And she was like, but Michelle, you do have a choice because if you didn't get up, we'd all show up and your girls would be okay. And no one would blame you. And, and I think at that point, like I realized like, whoa, like, I am making choices to do this and I am. And, and I think it was, it's processing through that. And I think it's right. different from my husband because, you know, he's at work and doing his job and it it's hitting him very differently. Sorry, our light no. <laughs> I think I need a new light. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, well said, well said. Um, all right. So uh, one more time, the foundation, the Melina Michelle Edenfield Foundation. And you can find them online. There's an event coming up in March, an evening of joy. Yes. Um, all right, great. Well, I don't know what else. Uh, thank you, Stone Fruit Coffee uh, and Lift Marketing for a sponsor. Actually, Lift Marketing is a sponsor. And um, Stone Fruit Coffee, um, hopefully you enjoyed some of their fine brew yeah. coffee. Very good. All right, good. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, for dropping on by today. Um, we'll get this uh, show back up, and um, uh, you guys can all download it. Uh, check out the foundation. So, thank you so much for coming in today and sharing your story. I think it's I think it's really just amazing. Um, you know, it it really hit home with me. Uh, just you know, having having children, and, and uh, my heart goes out to you guys. And however we can support you, we will. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. I appreciate the time and. Always choose joy. Great.